Okay. So um, this is the latest installment of the Iowa OER webinar series. We kind of hold these semi-regular information sessions for people working on various types of OER projects in the state of Iowa and beyond. I've always, um, as always, if you have topics of interest that we haven't covered yet that you'd like to see, you can always feel free to reach out to Iowa OER through the Google group um, listserv that we maintain. I'd also recommend um, to folks who are interested in OER, I'd recommend that you join that listserv. We have a lot of updates about new resources and new developments in OER that can be very helpful. Uh, my name is Mariah Burnett. I'm the scholarly communications librarian at the University of Iowa. Normally, I sort of um, moderate these events, but today I'm actually going to be the one presenting. And we're going to be covering today uh, various OER authoring tools that you can use to, um, to create your own OER. So this session is really for people who have some kind of passing familiarity with OER. Maybe you've started to review some content. Um, you know, maybe you've seen OER that you like, that you'd like to maybe edit or remix. Or maybe you're ready to kind of take the plunge and start drafting your own OER. And so um, that's really what this today's presentation is for, is for people who are kind of hoping to, to get started with that. So I'm going to be demonstrating some tools today. It's going to be mostly sort of a live demo of some, some platforms. And there's a couple different ways that you can sort of interact with this webinar. You can just follow along and kind of watch um, what's happening on the screen or you can open up a web browser on your own computer and kind of try to follow along with what I'm doing. Um, if you have questions or if anything I'm saying is not making sense or is confusing, just feel free to put your hand up or unmute your mic and, and we can kind of go over um, things right as, a, as I'm saying them. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to start with, hold on a second, the slideshow. Okay, so let's start by talking a little bit about what we mean by OER authoring tools. Um, so I have a colleague here at the University of Iowa who likes to refer to uh, Pressbooks in particular as the typewriter in the cloud. And I think that's a pretty good characterization of what open um, educational resource authoring tools are. So they're really any platform that allows you to create and disseminate OER. And they really sort of run the gamut in terms of technological um, sort of involvement. Some of them have a very low barrier of entry in terms of technological skills. Some of them are a little more advanced and kind of facilitate some more robust um, sorts of technologies. So this slide here, I, I borrowed um, and sort of edited a bit from Abby Elder's OER Starter Kit. These are just some examples of OER authoring tools. This is in no way an exhaustive list, but I did just want to um, kind of show some differences, right? So on the low tech end of things, um, you can even consider tools like Google Docs or Microsoft Word or LibreOffice OER authoring tools. Um, in fact, a lot of people who author OER will start by creating their entire manuscript in, in Microsoft Word and then move it over to another platform. But you actually don't even need to do that. You can, you know, as long as you're making your work publicly available and it's in a format that most people can access, um, you know, you can use a word processing program to draft OER. Um, one thing that you might want to be aware of, though, is like, for instance, if you're creating your work in Microsoft Word, um, you should be aware that not everybody has access to that particular program. So you might want to save your output as an ODT file instead of um, a DOC file, for instance. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to kind of put that plug in there. If, you, if you're sort of like at the point where word processing tools are, are your speed, that's absolutely fine. There's other tools as well. So LibreOffice Draw is a great one. It's part of the LibreOffice suite and it allows you to create images. So, you know, if you have graphics and figures and other resources that you'd like to create and add to your OER, um, that tool is really excellent for that. Inkscape is another one. Um, you can use it to create graphics, vector graphics, but you can also use it to edit PDFs, which can be really helpful if you are using source material in your OER that only lives in PDF form. So say you find a PDF, it's openly licensed, you'd really like to edit it and use it in your class, but maybe you don't have access to the full Adobe suite for editing PDFs. Um, Inkscape can help with that. Then there's some sort of more medium tech solutions. Um, we're going to be talking about Pressbooks as well as the OER Commons Open Author Tool in detail today. I would say those both are sort of medium tech <laughs> tools. Pressbooks is really meant to handle uh, book and text-based sort of OER. So if the, if the OER that you want to draft is going to really be heavy on the text and you want it to really look like a book, 
Pressbooks is a great tool for that. The OER Commons Open Author Tool um, is another thing that kind of allows you to create text-based OER. But the thing that's really great about OER Commons is that it's, it's a fairly simple to use tool, and it's also built right into the OER Commons platform. So, you know, if you've seen that platform before, you know that it's one of the larger sort of OER repositories, right? It, it runs the gamut from, you know, K-12 all the way up to, you know, post-grad in terms of what it covers. There's, you know, OER in all different formats on that platform. And so it's, it's good to create your OER right there because it'll then be discoverable on the platform without really having to do much else. And then finally, there are some more high tech solutions. Um, Getbook is an example of one of those. So, you know, if you have a project on GitHub, which, um, you know, people use a lot in computer science and mathematics and some other disciplines as well, um, you can use the Getbook platform and it kind of overlays on GitHub and can create outputs based on that platform. Jupyter Notebooks is another one that is a little more robust. It, um, it is really great for demonstrating live code or mathematical equations or sort of like non-standard scripts. Um, but again, the barrier of entry is a little higher for, for something like Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and again, this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. This is just sort of a sampling of some of the tools that you might decide to use. But today, we're really going to focus on three main platforms, Pressbooks, uh, the OER Commons Open Authoring Tool, and LibreText, which is another very robust kind of somewhat complicated system um, that's getting sort of more robust and more easy to use as time goes on. So right now, I'm going to um, get out of my slide presentation, and I'm going to start with Pressbooks. So before, um, before we actually kind of look under the hood with Pressbooks, I'd like to just kind of give you all a tour of kind of what a Pressbook web book looks like for the end user, just so you can kind of get an idea of the anatomy of a book. Um, I should also mention too, before we get started, that the platform that I'm going to be demonstrating today is pressbooks.com. And anyone can sign up for an account there and get started creating books. Um, you don't have to be affiliated with any sort of institution or anything like that. Um, there is also, though, Pressbooks.edu, and um, in Pressbooks.edu is typically um, a platform that institutions subscribe to, so there'll be institutional instances of these. Um, some of the schools in Iowa have them, so University of Iowa and Iowa State, for sure. I think there may be some other schools, too, that have um, um, sort of an institutional instance of Pressbooks, and if you have that, I would highly encourage you to go through the edu route rather than the .com um, for two reasons. One, because you will have some local support on campus um, to kind of help you troubleshoot, but also the edu version does have a few more sort of advanced features that the .com version doesn't have. But you know, if your institution doesn't have a subscription to the edu version, it's fine. You can still use the .com version. And it's it's fairly similar to the edu version. Okay. So what we're looking at now is um, just kind of a, a primer that I've used with some of our local um, OER grant recipients, but I just want to kind of use it to, to show sort of the anatomy of these books. So what you can see here is kind of the main uh, web book page that people first see when they click on the link to your book. And on that page, you can see there's title, subtitle, author, um, sort of a short description. And then there's um, the license that this book is published under, which in this case is a CC BY license. Um, you'll see there's a, a read button. Um, when users click on this, they'll be taken sort of into the book itself. And they can navigate either through this contents menu on the side, or there's, um, there's sort of a, a arrow that you can use to kind of go through the book that way. There's also on the EDU version, um, the ability to download the book in a variety of different formats. And you can choose as the editor and author, um, you know, which formats you want to make available to people. Um, the .com version does not allow you to display the downloads on the web book, but it does allow you to generate outputs that you can then share with other people. So it's a little bit complicated, but there is a workaround for that, that you can, you can still share different outputs of your press book with people, even though, it won't appear right on the main homepage. So then below the fold, there's um, a table of contents that you can use to kind of see what's in the book. And then below that, um, you'll see some more detailed metadata uh, about the book. You know, again, authorship, statement, license. Um, here's a citation. 
And then um, down here too, you kind of see some of that same information repeated. So that's kind of just the basic anatomy of what people see when they're encountering Pressbooks, you know, from the user side. But now I want to, to really kind of look under the hood and see um, sort of what these things look like behind the scenes. So I'm going to start by going just to pressbooks.com. And again, if you're following along on your computer, you can, you can do this too. Um, from this page, this main Pressbooks page, if you go to log in and you haven't created an account yet, it will prompt you to set up a free account and it will prompt you to enter a title for a book and a URL. So basically what it's doing is helping you kind of set up your first press book. And so you wanna choose a title that's you know, descriptive of what it is that you're writing. And hopefully you'll find a URL that hasn't already been taken. That's also sort of descriptive of what it is you're writing. So when I click on login, because I've already set up an account, it's taking me to my profile page. And um, this is where you would enter sort of information about yourself as an author, Mine is very minimal, but you can add as much information as you want, um, you know, your various websites, sort of a biographical sketch, your institution, profile picture, and then those will display um, in various points. So um, you can see here, if I go to the dashboard that's right above this, this sort of takes me into the main dashboard for, for Pressbooks. And from here, I could do one of two things. I could either create a new book um, or I could clone a book. So creating a new one is what you wanna do if you're completely starting from scratch. If you don't have a lot of source material that you're incorporating, you're mostly just writing your book from scratch, you can click on new book. If you're wanting to clone a book, you can actually click on this and enter a URL for an existing press book and just copy it over to your platform. And when you do that, you can make edits, you can remix it with other content, you can kind of make it your own in that way. I'm not going to click on either one of these right now because I've already set up several kinds of examples here. Um, you'll see any kind of book that you create in Pressbooks will appear under my books. So I'm just gonna go into this one. Okay, there we go. So when you click into an actual book, you'll see the menu options on the left-hand side of the screen here change somewhat, right? So you have a lot more options here. And then in the middle, you sort of see um, the basic anatomy of your book. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, right now, what I wanna do is talk about kind of setting up the look and feel of your book, the appearance, adding collaborators and things like that. So in order to kind of customize your book, give it like a nice, um, a nice front page on that web book interface, you'll wanna to go to book info. And this is where you enter the metadata about your book. This is the type of information that you would typically see on the cover of a book or a title page. Um, but there's spaces here to enter your title, short title, subtitle. Um, you don't have to fill out all of these. You know, there's, there's not required fields here. So just fill out what, what's important, right? So um, I'm showing up as an author, but I can add new authors here by clicking on this button. There's all sorts of other roles, editors, translators, et cetera. I can add any of any new people from this page. Um, there's also an area to add publisher information. So you could add, you know, your institution and the city where, where that is. Um, your publication date will be kind of the day you make the book public, probably. And then if you have an ISBN or a DOI, you can add those in here too, although those aren't really necessary for OER necessarily. You can select your language. And then down here, this is where you would add a cover image. So um, if you go through the Pressbooks directory, which kind of lists all the Pressbooks that are made public, you'll see these really sort of run the gamut. Some people don't add an image. Some people will add sort of a static image that represents the content of their book, but without any text. Some people will try to mock up sort of a book cover that includes both an image and um, title and author information. It's really kind of up to you. Um, I will say that if you have a book cover that really does sort of look like a book cover, um, you know, it, it's, it's to your advantage, right? Because people are kind of used to seeing that in, in ebook systems, right? That seeing the thumbnail of the book cover. So you might wanna give some thought to the image that you decide to upload here. Um, then you'll need to select your subjects. There's a drop down menu, but there's also a text box. So, you know, like say this is about education. I could type it in and hopefully, yeah, education would come up as well as other subject headings that are a bit more descriptive. Um, you'll want to choose a subject because that will help Pressbooks classify where your book will 
appear in the directory in other places. And then below here, you'll see there's a copyright area. It's really important that you fill this out because this is where you'll display your Creative Commons license. You need to identify yourself as the copyright holder and other, any other co-authors you may have. And then you can select your license. Um, so Pressbooks does allow you to keep it under full copyright, but if you were planning on creating OER, you'll really want to make sure that you're selecting a license that allows for the full, um, the full reuse that, that people might want to do with your book. Um, you'll also need to make sure when you're selecting your license, if you have source material that you're including in your press book, you'll want to make sure that the license you select is compatible with, with all of the licenses on your sources. And so that's kind of a different topic for a different day. We could spend a whole hour talking just about that. But if you go to the Creative Commons website, they have a lot of really great material about choosing a license and making sure that your license is compatible with your sources and things like that. Um, you can also put additional information in this copyright notice area. Um, sometimes I see people putting source material attributions in here or other sorts of notes that help people understand the copyright status of the book. Under here, you can choose a tagline, a short description, and a long description. This, this is important for people, you know, it's sort of like an abstract on an article, right? It's important for people to be able to know what your book is about in, you know, just a sentence or two. So once you fill that out and hit save over here, then, um, you know, here, I'll just do that. I'll hit save, even though there's not much here. And then if I actually go to visit the book, you can see there's very minimal information here, right? Because I haven't filled much of it out, but if I had filled more of it out, you would see it here. So toggling back to admin, um, what I'd like to do now that we've sort of looked at metadata is to look at the appearance of the book. So another really nice thing about Pressbooks is that it has these pre-populated themes that you can choose from. And they're all sort of based on, you know, font families and, and different types of usage. And there's 21 different themes. So you can kind of go through here and see if any of them catch your eye. If you find one that you like, you can always go to theme details and it will tell you a bit about it, right? So it tells you some details about the font and sort of about what it's used for. So this one has been tagged, for instance, with academic, nonfiction, textbook. So, you know, if you're creating a textbook, this might be a good choice, right? And so once you pick the theme that you want to work with, you can also customize it further, right? So you can go to theme options. Right now, the theme I have selected is called McLuhan. And, um, but, you know, within each theme, there's sort of options that you can use to, to customize things further. So like for instance, um, this one uses purple for a header background in the examples text box. Maybe I wanted this to be a different color. I can, I can change that from this menu. There's some global options. There's also some options that are particular to the web, you know, so you could, you could change header fonts or body fonts in the web version. There's also some customization for the PDFs as well as ebook, right? And so those can kind of help you um, get things looking how you want them to look. If you're a real whiz at, um, at style, and if you know CSS and you're able to edit style sheets, you can go under custom styles and actually go right in and edit the style sheet. Um, I wouldn't suggest you do that unless you really know what you're doing. I don't know what I'm doing in terms of this, but you know, there are plenty of people who do know um, how to work with style sheets. And if that's you, knock yourself out. So there's some other links here too. Um, I will talk about the exports in just a minute. Um, I think it kind of makes sense to talk about that later, but I do want to quickly mention that you can also add um, users to your book beyond just like authors and editors and things like that. You can add collaborators. So if you go here, you know, here's me, but you can add new users too. So say I wanted to add an editor, you know, another author, I could just add their email in. Um, another thing people use this for quite a bit is like maybe you're in the middle of drafting your press book, you're not quite ready to make it public yet, but you'd like your students to be able to use it before you make it public. So you could keep it private and then you could add your students as subscribers, right? And so they could actually view the book, um, but it would still be private. Okay, so now um, I realize we're kind of hopping around this menu quite a bit, but there's a lot here. <laughs> so um, I just kind of want to show you the most important parts. Um, the organized menu is where you go to really set your content and to actually create, you know, the book itself. So this interface kind of comes three pre-populated with three main sections, the front matter, the main body, and the back matter. 
And that's pretty typical of a, of a book, right? Like most books will have some kind of an introduction or, you know, um, acknowledgements. A lot of things, a lot of times I've seen in OER, people will have a separate sort of piece of front matter that, that tells the users kind of how to use the book or how to reuse it. You could do that here as well. Um, it comes pre-populated with an introduction, but if you don't want the introduction, you can always just select trash and it will get rid of it. Um, what I'd like to do though is actually click on edit so we can see what the text editor looks like. So when you click on this, this is the interface um, through which you will develop your text. And um, so if you've ever used like an LMS or any sort of web publishing tool, this interface should look somewhat familiar to you. It's a WYSIWYG editor that allows you to add text and images and all sorts of other things and sort of manipulate the look and feel of them. So we have our introduction here. You can add media by clicking on this button here and pulling in files um, of various types. Another way to add media is actually like if you want to, for instance, add a YouTube video into this book, all you have to do is paste the link to the YouTube video right into the body of the text and it will embed. And so, um, you know, that's a really nice way to add media too. You can just put the link in and then it will show up right in the page as an iframe. And that can be really nice too. So moving down, um, these are the different ways to format text. Um, our headings menu is here. You want to make sure that when you're drafting your content or you know migrating it from Microsoft Word or whatever it is you're doing, you want to make sure that you're following a logical heading structure. You know that will help people who um, who struggle with um, with various like people who have visual learning disabilities or, or other things. But it also helps you know fully cited users to um, navigate through text. And then we have, you know, the basic sorts of formatting tools that you would see on any text editor, you know, ways to add bulleted lists and numbered lists and quotes and things like that. There's also a menu here for um, tweaking the indents. So you can have like an indent or a hanging indent. You can change your text tracking. You can add pull quotes. And then um, there's also a box next to it that allows you to add pullout boxes. So, um, you know, there's a standard pullout box, key takeaways, exercises. A lot of people like to start each chapter with a learning objectives box. And that can be kind of nice. It can signal to your reader, you know, okay, I'm in a new chapter. It can also really help focus the reader because the learning objectives are right there in front and they know exactly what it is they're going to be um, reading. And it also just adds kind of a nice visual element, right? Some kind of color that breaks up the, the text. And so, um, yeah, people use text boxes all over Pressbooks and they, they kind of have a nice look and feel. Again, you can change all sorts of things about the text, the color, background color. Again, you wanna make sure you're following best practices with that in terms of accessibility. Um, you can also add tables to Pressbooks as well as footnotes. Um, if you are in mathematics or computer science and you work with latex, you can also add in, you know, mathematical equations and things here too. So then, um, you know, once you have your content here, you can also kind of customize whether or not you want to allow people to comment on the work. Um, you can add your own comments. And then this area here, each chapter um, will allow you to enter metadata just for that chapter. That can be really important if you are editing or creating a work where each chapter kind of has a different author or has different uh, a different license, for instance, um, then you would want to maybe fill out the metadata section. Otherwise, you don't have to. If the whole book is written by a single author and has a single license, you don't actually have to fill out the metadata section if you don't want to. But it does really help your user, especially if there's multiple authors, multiple licenses and things like that. Okay, so then, um, you know, over here too, you can also choose whether or not to have this uh, chapter actually show up in the web version of the book and then the exports, and you can decide, you know, sort of where you want it to live as well. And so then uh, all you have to do is hit save, and then you can view it, and what it would actually look like. Again, I barely have any content in here, so it doesn't look very spectacular, but you can kind of toggle back and forth between viewing the book and then going back into admin to actually work with the content. Okay, so um, another thing to mention about sort of the structure of a press book is that it comes pre-populated with one kind of main body. 
And one way that you could structure your book is to um, just create multiple chapters under that main body by adding in, you know, chapter. We'll call this one chapter two, maybe. Um, and, you know, you can have your whole book just sort of flow from this one main body. But uh, another kind of technique that people use is to create parts to their book. And you see this a lot, you know, in commercial textbooks too, where maybe like the first three chapters are about, um, let's say, uh, accessibility. And maybe the next section is about um, authoring tools, let's just say. Um, you might want to create another part that would sort of group the chapters by um, the topic. And so I could do that here. So let's say I want to add one on accessibility. Now, when I go back, you'll see now I have this whole new chapter. If you do decide to organize your book by parts, you'll want to go back to the main body and probably change the name, right? So you'll want it to be more descriptive, something like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, whatever you want it to be. <laughs> um, and then so what that will look like in the actual web book is if you go into read books, you can see under contents now, um, I can expand this and I can see the chapters underneath it. Okay. So um, same with the back matter. It's also sort of pre-populated with, with one chapter for an appendix. If you don't want back matter, you can just delete it. If you want to add other types of back matter, you can do that by just clicking on this button here and adding another chapter. Um, so things you might want to include in the back matter in addition to appendices might be things like um, an index or a glossary or just you know, handouts, other sorts of things that you might want to put sort of at the back of the book, you can put there. You'll notice that this interface also has these check boxes here to allow you to either show content in the web and the exports in both. Um, I would say in most cases, you want your content to appear in all the different formats. Um, one, one exception to that might be if you have, um, you know, some content that's very interactive, like say you have a lot of interactive elements in one of your chapters, you might not want those, those interactive elements to appear in a PDF, for instance, because people won't, won't be able to engage with them. But, you know, you can kind of um, work with, with what you want in terms of display in that regard. Um, speaking of exports, we can go back to this export button. I did want to mention um, really quick how you can work with exports. So at the very beginning, I was talking about how with the Pressbooks EDU instance, you have a, a drop down menu where you can access all different formats of the book. And that's really helpful if you have an e-reader that you're working with or um, some other sort of system that's um, working with the content of your book. The .com version, as I mentioned, doesn't allow you to access it right from the web book, but it does allow you to export your book into these various formats. And then the exports just appear on this kind of list right here. So I've already run some exports. Say for instance, I really wanted my users to be able to access the EPUB version of this book too. I could download it and then I could add it back into my book, say in the introduction or um, you know, in the acknowledgement or some section, chapter one, whatever you wanted to do. Um, you could actually upload this right into the book so then people could have access to the EPUB. That, that would be one workaround. Um, you, know, you could also just share those outputs with individual users upon request. That's another way that you could um, sort of work with those exports because they don't automatically generate on the front page for people. Some other things about Pressbooks. I realize that there's just a lot to go over here, but I do quickly want to talk about the tools and, this, and the settings maybe a bit. Um, so with the tools under here, you can choose again to import or clone a book from another system. You can do that um, by uploading a file or importing from a URL. That should bring in um, the content and, and you can choose, I think, too, whether or not to, um, to strip out the formatting and to make the formatting kind of conform to the theme that you've selected or to kind of keep the, the formatting from the, the original text. Um, that's important. If you, if you are using a Pressbooks EDU instance instead of the .com, you'll see another uh, tool under here for H5P integrations. I don't know how many of you are familiar with H5P, but it's a protocol that allows you to incorporate interactive elements into your OER. So those could be things like flashcards, they could be things like heat maps, quizzes, all sorts of different sorts of things that people would be able to interact with in the live book. 
And so the EDU version of Pressbooks does have a tool that allows you to generate H5P integrations. The .com version does not, unfortunately, but you can always use another system that allows for H5P to be developed or grab another H5P exercise that's already in existence, and you can always just add it to the book. Um, so it's a little clunkier. You can't actually create the integrations right in Pressbooks with a .com version, but you still can add them into the book you know, using the add media button that we saw in the text editor. Um, okay, settings. This is where um, you know you can decide who gets to see your book. Um, you know, right now it's only logged in editors and administrators. You can choose just subscribers. Right now, though, I mean, this does not actually make the book public. Um, in order to do that, you have to go to organize, I believe. No, that's not it. Dashboard. No. Um. <laughs> I think maybe it's, yeah, I'm not sure, but there is a there is a button somewhere in here. I think it's maybe um, on the dashboard. Let's try that. No, but anyway, there's a publish button somewhere where you can you can kind of toggle it to make sure that the book is actually public instead of private. It's driving me nuts now. I, I thought it was right here in the organized section, but I guess it's not. Anyway, we can look for that a little later, but there is a radio button in Pressbooks that allows you to toggle the book from private to public. And, and um, you may wanna kind of wait until your book is completely done or mostly done before you make it public. Okay, so I realize we've gone over a lot. <laughs> we still have a couple more tools to, um, to demonstrate, but I thought I would pause here and just see if anybody has any questions about Pressbooks so far. Okay, hearing none, I think we can move on. Um, I'd like to talk now about the OER Commons um, authoring tool. So I think probably most of you are at least passingly familiar maybe with OER Commons. It's kind of one of the major repositories where you can find OER. Um, I'm just going to do a quick search and show you um, a couple of pieces of OER that were created using the authoring tool in OER Commons. If you want to find examples of your own, if you go under, you can search for whatever you want and then go under content source. And you can see here, there's a couple different iterations of the, of the open author tool. I'm going to go to open author 2, 2.0. And you can see in this list, these are all OER that were created using the most recent version of the open author tool. Um, I'm just going to kind of go into one at random. Hopefully I picked a good one. Sometimes these take a little bit to load. Taking a long time to load. Let me try another one. Oh my. Well, this doesn't seem to want to open for me. Maybe you're having better luck if you're following along on your own desktop, but, um, but it, when you, okay, here we go, finally. Um, yeah, so once you click on one of these OERs that have been created with the open author tool, you'll see there's kind of a brief description, licensing information, and then if you click on view resource, it will take you into the resource itself. So this is kind of a standard view of an OER created on this platform. You know, in the middle, there's kind of the student view, and then there's an instructor section over on the right. And you can kind of toggle through the different um, bits of content by clicking on next, and it will kind of take you screen by screen. This one only has two um, pages, I, I guess, but there is this um, attached resource, which it looks like is maybe a syllabus or some kind of other um, information. Um, so you can see there, it's a fairly simple interface. You know, some of these are longer than others. This one's fairly short. Um, but if we wanted to go ahead and create something with a similar look, all we'd have to do is go to add OER. And here, um, if you already have developed your OER in another platform, you can always add it through here. But if you click on create resource, this will take you into the open author tool. And as you'll see, just like with Pressbooks, there's a text editor here that you can use to develop your content. This interface is a bit more simple, as you'll see. There's um, a space to, to title your book. So I'm just going to call it that. You can also add a title image right here. 
And then um, below it, there's a way to sort of add content by sections. So let's say my first section will be introduction. You know, I could type in my content here. Um, just like what we saw with Pressbooks, there's ways to format your text. The text editor here is a, a bit more basic. Um, it doesn't have quite as many options as Pressbooks did, but there's still, you know, ways to add images and tables to check for accessibility, um, all sorts of things. You can also import text directly from Google Drive or from Word, which is pretty nice. You know, if you've created your content already in Word, you know, you can pretty easily copy it to this platform. You can also add resources like we saw with the example, there was an attachment to that OER. Um, you could add attachments to this as well. And then you would add your instructor notes here. And so then um, I could add as many new sections as I wanted to. You know, the one that we saw only had two sections, but you can, there's no limit to the number of sections that you can add. And so once you have that done, if you hit next, it will save it and then it will ask you to describe the resource. So this is where you would add your abstract. You could put um, an, an image in here if you wanted to do that. You'd have to choose your Creative Commons license. Again, you know, you'll want to make sure that you're, you're choosing a license that fits your purposes but also doesn't um, you know, violate anybody else's copyright. Here's where you can add subject terms. You know, again, you'll want to try to be as accurate as possible so that um, your OER is categorized correctly in the system. Um, you can add your educational level, the material types, languages. And then if you're in K-12, um, you can align the resource with educational standards too. Um, and then there's also some other tags that you can use here to describe your resource. And then you just click the box and hit publish. It's as simple as that. Um, then your resource will appear in OER Commons and people can, can access it and find it and use it, which makes it pretty simple. Um, there isn't a whole lot much more to say about OER Commons. Does anybody have any questions about this authoring tool? If we have time at the end, there are a couple little things to, to mention about making sure that your OER Commons OER appears where you want it to. Um, I don't know, we may have time to get to that um, a, a bit later. Okay, let's see. All right, so now, um, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to go into our third and final tool, which is also kind of the most complicated in some ways. It's still under development and it's still being streamlined, but um, it's called LibreText. And it is um, a platform that was developed by the University of California at Davis. And it was funded by the Department of Education at the federal level. So they received a grant maybe about five years ago, maybe not quite that long ago, for several million dollars to develop um, a platform that would make OER interoperable so that people could easily remix content, could add in homework, questions, other sorts of interactive elements, and create their own OER in sort of a modular way. And they're, they're definitely sort of working towards that goal. Um, and I'd like to kind of just show you some of the, the things to, to know about LibreText. So if you just go to LibreText.org, this is their main page. Um, one thing you'll notice if you go under Explore Libraries, um, these are the kind of content areas that LibreText focuses in. They don't cover everything. And this really started as sort of a STEM-based system. Um, since then, they've expanded you know, to, to lots of different areas. but but not everything, right? So um, if you see your discipline kind of fitting into one of these categories, um, that's great. You can kind of hopefully find a lot of good content here. Another thing to know is that to get full access to all of the resources and be able to remix things and, and use them, you have to sign up for an account through LibreText. And you actually have to sign up for multiple accounts for multiple parts of the system. And I'll, I'll talk through that kind of as we as we go, but I have signed up for the humanities library. That's kind of what they assigned to me when I told them I was doing a demo. So when I go here, you'll see, um, you know, it shows me as logged in. If you're trying to follow along on your site, you'll see something different. You'll see that this bar is kind of gray and it'll give you the ability to request an account It's kind of up here somewhere. Um, and then I believe this blue bar on the side isn't there either, but as soon as you request an account and you sign in using the login they give you, um, you should be able to see what I see. So all of the libraries kind of have these three main components, the campus bookshelves, the bookshelves, and the learning objects. Um, the campus bookshelves are basically remixes that have already been done by people. 
and kind of reshared, right? And, and they're grouped kind of around campus. So, um, you know, like say I wanted to see all of the remixes done by Evergreen Valley College in the humanities. I could click here. And it looks like there's one basically, but you can see that they've maybe pulled this content from many different OERs and you can, you can access their remix right here. One thing to be aware of in LibreText, um, a lot of OER sort of have like a, a look and feel of a book where you feel like you're sort of turning the page as you're going through it. LibreText is a bit different. It's, um, it has these kind of content boxes that populate the screen and you can go kind of just navigate them section by section. It's maybe a little bit different than what you're used to seeing with some other OER, but, um, but if you prefer, you can always read these um, as PDFs too. You can go into the full book or the chapter and, and view it as a PDF. But this is a great way to see how people have taken, you know, the source material in LibreText and remixed it for their own purposes. So, you know, you may want to sort of explore um, some of these campus bookshelves just to see what other people have done. There's also just the main bookshelf. These are kind of like the main um, source content that is, have been developed um, by LibreText. Um, again, because this is humanities, it's such a broad category. There's there's subcategories here. Let's say I'm interested in literature and literacy. If I open that, you can see all of these various books that have been created by LibreText for literature and literacy. And again, I can go into the book itself and view individual chapters or view the book as a whole if I go into the PDF. Um, I'm gonna go back one more time and show you the learning objects. So these are more sort of like um, interactive elements that you can that you can fold into a book. Here's some, some interactive architecture integrations. There's an interactive art library. Um, you can go in and look at some of these things. And these are all fair game to put into your, your book as well. So um, to actually create one of the books, you, you do have to have an account as I mentioned, but once you do, if you kind of click on this, you'll see there's some options underneath your login. I'm going to go to my sandbox. And this is where you can see I've got some training and tutorials. This all just came pre-populated when I signed up for my account. And then my actual sandbox is here by my email. And when I click in that, you can see these are all remixes that I've sort of played around with. They're all sort of like, my press book that I demonstrated for you, mostly empty, but, um, but you can see they're stored here. And um, this is where I can edit content. Um, so like, say I wanted to go into my humanities book and I wanted to edit chapter one, I could go there and hit edit and you know add whatever content I wanted to add here. And then it would save if I hit save. Um, one thing to be aware of, though, when you're creating remixes and Libra texts, um, they're actually just private in your sandbox until you publish them. And then to do that, you have to actually contact Libra texts and say, you know, I want to make this public. I want to set up my own campus bookshelf for this. And, and they can kind of walk you through that process. Um, so yeah, those are kind of like, you can find your remixes under the sandbox. But I should back up and actually show you how to make a remix. So. Um, these blue kind of menu options on the side, if you go under tools, this is where you can access a lot of the kind of advanced features of LibreText once you have your account. And um, the OER remixer is where you want to go to actually be able to create um, a new remix. So this is the remixer. If you read this little blurb up here, it will, it will tell you that you should really use a remixing map. Um, you don't have to do that, but it really is helpful. It's kind of a crosswalk that you would kind of do before you create your remix, where you would say, okay, this is the content I want to cover in my book. These are the books from Libra text that really seem to have content that sort of fit my criteria. And you'd really just map out what you want to pull over and, you know, in what order and things like that before you actually create the remix. Um, so, you know, they, they strongly recommend that. So I would maybe, maybe give that a try if I were you. So um, I'm going to call this one new remix. You do have to title these in order to save them. But you'll see there's kind of two panels here. There's the library panel and the remix panel. Um, the library panel is the source material, and the remix panel is the OER you're creating. So you can choose. Right now, I'm in the humanities library, but I can, I can actually pull content from any library. It doesn't have to just be humanities. So say I really want to put in some Spanish content into my book for some reason. 
So, you know, these are the different um, resources that are available in this library. I can drill down to the chapter level. Let's say I really want to add this chapter and I want it to be like right after the front matter, you know, maybe right after chapter one. I just drag it over and there it is. So I can add in chapters from, you know, the bookshelves, from the campus bookshelves, from the learning objects. And I basically just kind of pull in any content that I want um, over into the remix. And then I just hit save to server and I get taken to this screen. This is where things get a little complicated. So you can see here, there's the summary of kind of what I've done. And it says there's 97 pages that will be copy transcluded and zero pages that will be copy forked. I'm not exactly sure why they use this language. It's a bit confusing. Copy transcluded means that anytime you would edit this page in your remix, you're actually editing the source material. <laughs> and so, and it defaults to that, which is a bit strange. So after you've, you've grabbed your content that you want to include in your remix and it's time to edit, you wanna make sure that you're actually changing all of the pages from copy transcluded to copy forked. And the reason you do that is because you want to actually just edit your own local copy. You don't wanna edit the source material, unless there's some kind of glaring error or something that really should be edited in, in the source material. So anyway, I'm going to save this and you'll see it takes a while, right? Like it, it'll sort of show you your progress as it's remixing. I hope this doesn't take too long. Uh, if it does, I might just go back to my sandbox and, and demonstrate this on another book, but I think I will do that actually. <laughs> so while that's kind of pre-populating, I'm gonna go back to my sandbox and I will show you how to make sure you're forking your content so you're not actually editing the new, um, the source material. So, okay, I'm going in here and say I wanna edit my front matter. I'll go in and if I go under options, you can see there's this thing called the forker. <laughs> if you click on the forker, um, I'm now you know, able to edit this without editing the original. Kind of a strange little thing to, to have to do, but, um, but make sure you do, you do that. If you do end up using um, LibreText. So that's kind of how you would set up your remix. Um, you could also though, there's other tools to use um, with LibreText. It's not just books that you can create through this. There's also um, under tools, this pretty slick thing called the Adapt Homework System. And unfortunately, you, the Adapt Homework System requires a whole separate login, a whole separate account. And you actually have to register for it as an instructor to get full, full access and you have to get an access code. And I have contacted LibreText for an access code and have not received it yet. And so unfortunately, I'm not really going to be able to look under the hood quite as well um, as I would normally you know, with, with the Adapt system, but I can kind of describe for you what's in Adapt. So, Essentially, it, it's, a, it's a library that handles um, auto-graded questions as well as questions that require sort of human mediation. There's formative test questions, summative assessments, all sorts of different types of homework that you can either um, send students directly to the platform for so they can go, you know, sign up for a student account and interact with that homework right on LibreText, or you can embed it in your textbook, you can share it through your LMS, you can use it with a clicker system. And it uses, um, it has integrations with a lot of existing homework systems. So for instance, it integrates with WebWork, with IMath AS, which is the system that gives us MyOpenMath and Lumen, as well as um, there's some H5P content in here as well. And so once you do sign up, it's great because you can just see what other people have used, pull questions into your own system, pull them into your own book and go from there. I will click on this link for commons. Just, I mean, this isn't super helpful, but it does show you, you know, some of the, at least the names of the assignments that are affiliated with some of these courses. And because I'm not logged in, I can't click on any of them. But if I was logged in, I would be able to sort of use these and integrate them um, quite easily with, with my existing um, books. There is also um, on LibreText, it's not linked from that tools menu, which it seems like it should be, but it's not. Um, there's this tool called the Libra Studio, which is all H5P integration. So again, like say you are um, creating your book, your OER and pressbooks.com, and you really want to include some H5P, but you don't have that integration in that platform, you could always sign up for a Libra Studio account. Um, and again, you do have to sign up for a separate account for this too. Um, and you can, you can browse existing integrations in whatever your discipline is. 
Um, you can browse them by author. Here's an example of one. This is um, some kind of an integration for MLA citations. So um, I think what it's having you do is it's like a drag and drop, you know, where you create a citation based on these elements. And so um, if you wanted to use this in your book, you could either click on this reuse button, which will let you download it as an H5P file, which then you could upload into Pressbooks or whatever system you're using, or you can just grab the embed code. You know, and this is just an iframe that you can display in, um, in your book too. Um, so either way works fine. And you can also create new H5P in the system as well. Um, you know, you can kind of choose different types of content. You know, there's interactive videos, presentations, multiple choice, dialogue cards. And then once you create, you know, whatever kind of um, integration you want to, you can then publish it in this library so that other people can use it as well. And so it's kind of this whole system of, of OER creation that's maybe not quite all linked up how it should be yet, but, but it's getting there. And in fact, um, there is this thing, I don't know if it's public yet. I think it is, but they're not really like promoting it yet. It's supposedly sort of like an all-in-one search interface for all of the Libra Commons tools, you know, so you can search across platforms, um, across libraries, across different types of content and find what you need, um, you know, just by a keyword search or by, you know, an advanced search or, or whatever. So um, I realized that we've really kind of torn through these platforms at breakneck speed, but uh, does anybody have any questions or have anything that they'd like me to clarify or revisit? Raya, this is Anne Marie. I had a question. Um, do you know if there are any existing like comparisons out there? I just want a simple table of here's how much this costs or not. Here are some of the basic features. Do you know of anything that compares these tools and other tools? I don't know of any that just compare them like in a chart form. I, I know like there's um, you know there's resources that sort of have textual descriptions of the different platforms, but none that I've seen that really compare price. It would be nice if there were some kind of a matrix like that, um, if anybody knows of one. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that might be something that oh, I, 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 OER might consider creating at some point maybe. Let's see, looking at the chat, I don't see any other questions, but um, any comments or anything, anybody who is kind of like following along on your own computer and, and finding sort of different, different things? Okay, well, hopefully this, you know, will give you a chance to sort of get your feet wet in some of these different platforms. They all sort of have their advantages and disadvantages, as you'll see, um, as you kind of get into these things. How can we learn more about copyright? Oh, that's a good question. So. Um, there's lots of different places you can go to learn about copyright. I would say for OER, it's most important to understand kind of open licensing. And for that, Creative Commons is really great. You know, they kind of walk you through the process of selecting a license and sort of what rights to retain, what rights to, um, to allow others to, um, to enjoy. Um, also, there's lots of libraries create sort of copyright guides for academics. We have one at the University of Iowa that I can pull up really quick and just drop in the chat that are a little more all-encompassing. So not just for OER, but like, you know, copyright considerations for, um, for teaching or for scholarship. Um, let me find that. But yeah, I'll dump that in the chat right now too. But, um, but yeah, Christine, um, oh, let's see. Yeah, Christine uh, gave a link to the licenses. And, and I think that's a really good page. It kind of explains exactly how the licenses work, you know, why, why we might use Creative Commons licenses and things like that. All right, well, if nobody has any other questions or anything, um, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. And if you have any other questions or if you're, you know, starting to experiment with some of these platforms and finding <laughs> you're running into trouble, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to Iowa OER through the Google group or to me directly. All right. Bye everybody, have a good day.